to this video that I have put together for my year 10 statistics class. And I'm recommending um, those students who were unable to attend this lesson, which I delivered in May, that you watch this, but I'm making it more widely available to um, other students in my classes and indeed perhaps some students from um, elsewhere in the year group who want to learn a little bit more about how to use formulae, how to use graphs in Excel. And uh, we're going to go through a number of tabs here. You will find I've put a copy of this spreadsheet in Satchel 1, and you can have a look at it yourself. And what I recommend to you is don't watch the entire video in one go. Watch, let's say, four or five explanations, then pause the video, open your own at Excel, Excel, and then practice that, and then try some more on the video. So it starts off really easy, and then it gets a little bit more challenging, but very useful and well worth investing the time. So we have a number of tabs. Here is my first tab. Use the sort tool. So I have a bunch of data there. Um, I use the word data, the pronunciation. Some people call it data. It doesn't really matter. And you'll see it's unsorted. So I was asked to find what's the mode. Then it's kind of tricky to work out where is the mode there? What about my median? Again, I would have to sort it. So what I do is I select the data with my cursor. It's called um, click and drag. And then I go up to where it says data on the top and click on data. And you will see a button says sort. Now, Excel is clever because it's realized that um, the, the cell above this is called data and it recognizes that it must be a header. And so it's saying, do you want to sort the data? And I'll say yes. And I'm going to sort it either smallest to largest or largest to smallest. Well, smallest to largest works for me. That's fine. And there it's been sorted. And once that's done, it's easier to find the mode. So for example, I say there's two 43s there. That's good. But there are three 45s. So it looks like my mode will be 45. What about my median? Well, I need to count how many, many do I have here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen bits of data. So you might know the formula to work out where the median is. If there's 19 items of data, then you do 19 plus one divided by two takes me to position 10, or if you don't know that formula, you can just cross off one from each end until you get to the middle. But it will be position 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which is 44. If you were to look at that number 44, you would say there are nine data points above it and nine numbers below it because it's right in the middle of an ordered list. So Excel has helped us to do this quickly by um, sorting for us, but actually Excel can make things even faster. Let's go on to number two. So here I'm asked to use some functions without needing to sort the data. So if I go to where it says mode, I can simply do this. I can type equals. Now equals tells Excel I'm not entering a number, I want to enter a formula or something like that. And I'm going to type mode. You'll see at the top of the screen I've said use mode brackets brackets and use median bracket brackets. So mode brackets and select this set of data. Again, I'm clicking and dragging and then I close my brackets just like you would if you were using a calculator. And you will see that my mode is indeed 45 without having to sort it. It can work out for me. And again, similarly, equals median brackets. Select the same thing. Tell it where I want to do it. And then close brackets. And you can see there 45, 44. What I worked up myself, 45, 44. It does it for me really quickly. So there are a lot of formulae you can use. I'm going to go just through a few 
of the more common ones today. Quick look here. If I go on the top, go to formulas. You can see it says insert function on the top left. And there are a lot of different types of functions and formulae that you can use there. But again, I'm going to do some of the more common ones. So number three. Again, I'm encouraging you to try this yourself. Don't just watch the video and think about it. Have a go. So equals, well, in this case, it's not maximum, it's max. What I want to do here is work out the range. To be able to find the range, I have to be able to work out the biggest and the smallest or the maximum and the minimum. So equals min brackets, select them. And there we go. Now, um, I can't easily see from my unordered list that it is 12 and 72. But if I go back to tab one, we had ordered it 12 and 72. Yes, they are. But now I want to do range. And this is where I'm going to use some functionality. It's not a formula. I'm going to do equals. And now I'm going to move up to the 72. And if you notice there, it says cell B25. So I'm going to click on B25. And then I'm going to type minus and move down to, to cell 27. So I've moved down to cell 27, which is B22, it's a 12. And if I hit the enter key, then that changes the range to 60. And now you can say, well, I do it with my calculator. But actually, one of the advantages of this is that if, say, I was to find my data had made a mistake, and that 72 should be 75, and if I change that to 75, then you will see that the range automatically updates. Now, your calculator doesn't do that. Let's just put it back to 72. And there is my range, my maximum and my minimum. So just to recap that, I do equals, I move up to the cell that I want, I select that cell, I hit the minus, I go to the next cell I want, and I hit enter, and that will do the calculation. We'll do something very similar to that in just a moment. Number four, to find the sum and the count. I want to know how many bits of data do I have there? Well, I already counted them, but it would be good to let Excel do that. And similarly, to be able to add them all up. So probably the most common Excel function is equals sum. So let's try that. Equals sum brackets, select them all. And this is so much faster than doing it on a calculator. And the total is 817. How many values are there? Well, I want to count them. So surprise, surprise, it's equals count, brackets, open brackets, and select the data set, close brackets, and apparently there are 19. So if I was asked to find the mean, then that would be the total, which is 817, divided by how many there are, which is 19. So why don't we do that? In the mean, we're going to do equals, I'm going to go up to my 817, which is um, cell B25. I'm going to hit the divide by a key, which in this case is a slash. And then I'm going to go up to B27, where my 19 is. And I'm going to say hit enter. And it works out for me that my mean is 43. Well, surprise, surprise, Excel can also do that for you. Tab five, same set of data, but this time, whereas we had count and sum and max and, and minimum, they were all will be expected, it doesn't actually have the word mean. If I was to type equals mean, it doesn't, it doesn't find it. And the reason is being American, they use the word average. So I'm going to type average brackets and here is my average. And it works out of 43, which we did before in tab four. That indeed was 43. 
So lots of very simple um, Excel functions, but as well, we're having to practice. So I know temptation is to say, well, I'll keep watching that straightforward. One of the things that I find students forget about is to hit the equal sign. So can I recommend you pause my video, open up that spreadsheet and just work through those five, work clicking and dragging, make sure you can do it because it is going to get more challenging in a moment or two. So let's continue then. I hope you found that useful. Number six, the geometric mean. Now, this is not found in GCSE mathematics. However, if you do statistics, you need to be able to find geometric mean. But also, if you do further mathematics, you need to know it as well. And so the idea of an arithmetic mean is you add them all up and divide by how many there are. The idea of a geometric mean is you multiply them together and then you take the root of how many there are. So if I had, let's say, the number 12 and 13, my arithmetic mean would be 12 plus 13 divided by 2. But my geometric mean would be 12 times 13 and then take the square root. So again, very similar, equals average as we did before and select my data set. So there is 137.2, and my geometric mean is geo, as in geometric, mean. And here, something interesting is going to happen. So I've left this one set like that because we get 136.81. Now that's interesting because we've got lots of decimal places I don't really want that many. So what I would do is I'd select that. If I right click on my mouse, I can call up format cells. And it'll, this little uh, window comes up and I can say, this is a number. And could I have it please at one decimal place? And if I do that, then you can see it immediately rounds for me. So all the work we did in rounding in maths, um, Excel will help with that as well. And you will see that the geometric mean is similar to, but not normally exactly the same as the arithmetic mean. When we might we use that? Well, very often we use it in terms of um, percentages year on year. So if I said that something increased by say 25% and then 20% and then decreased by 5%, I could use my geometric mean to work out the average increase over those three years. In that case, the arithmetic wouldn't be appropriate because you're multiplying each time. So moving on, quartiles. So if you want to draw a box plot, then you need to know your minimum, your lower quartile, your median, your upper quartile and your maximum. And we have already seen the formula for minimum, median, and maximum. But here, I want to show you a new function that allows you to use the one function for all five values. And it's a little bit more complicated. It's called quartile.inc. That means inclusive. So again, minimum equals quartile. You'll see there that we have three different quartile functions come up, but I'm going to use INC. Brackets, select my data, and this time I don't close the brackets, I hit a comma. You'll see there underneath it says array, comma, quart. So there is my comma, and it's giving me a choice of five different options. So, in this case, I want to have the minimum. So what I do is I type zero. And if I do that, you will see it tells the computer, give me the minimum. Lower quartile equals quartile.inc, brackets, select my data. And this time, number one. So comma, you'll see one is first quartile and that will give me my lower quartile. 
and I keep going through. Now, there are some shortcuts here. Um, I'm not going to confuse things by taking shortcuts. I'm just going to run through them quickly, but you can copy the code and then make some changes. Number two is the median. It's 44. We saw that earlier on. The upper quartile will be comma three. Again, it's there. And then the maximum finally equals quartile dot INC. Select my data. And number four, again, we found that earlier and it is 72. So that's a really useful function. If you wanted to draw a box plot uh, or a box and whisker diagram is also called that, then you can use Excel to help you with that or even just to check. Now we move on to what we call standard deviation. And this again is in statistics. It's what we call, it refers to a the distribution of data. Sometimes we might look at a box plot and talk about the median and the interquartile range. Well, the other way of doing data distribution is to talk about the mean and the standard deviation. So here for question eight, I'm asking myself to find the average and the standard deviation functions. So average again, absolutely as we did before, is just that, it's my mean. And standard deviation, again, if you're not familiar with this, don't worry about it, but it's a really quite a complicated calculation. To work this out, we would have to add up all of those data points and then divide by how many there are. And then we'd have to square each of those. So 23 squared, 54 squared, 23 squared, and add all of those together, divide by how many there are, combine those, and then take the square root. So it's quite a complicated calculation. So it's good that Excel can do it for me just in one go, just like this. Brackets, select my data, close brackets, and there is my standard deviation, 16.3. And that, obviously, if you were doing some work with standard deviation, that could be really, really handy. And sometimes we are asked about the, uh, the distribution. We're asked what value is a standard deviation to the right of the mean or to the left of the mean. We talk about there being approximately 65, 66% of the data plus in that area of plus and minus um, one standard deviation. So I would do equals, gonna go up to my mean, which you can see is B25, do a plus, going to add standard deviation. So that's 59.3. And then again for one less, go up to the mean and do a subtract. And I'm going to subtract my standard deviation. So what I'm saying there is that between the values of 26.7 and 59.3, we have 67, 68% of the data. And if you look at that, actually, you can see that, yeah, most of the data, uh, majority of data would be between those two points. Again, that's assuming that is a normal distribution and uh, that's for perhaps another day. So again, this would be a good point to pause the video and to go back and try some of those a slightly more complicated formulae. And welcome back. We're now going to go and look at some graphs and looking at a bar chart. So here, let's imagine we've done a survey. We've asked people, what type of uh, pet do you like, do you have? And so we've got some responses back and I want to draw a bar chart. Well, Excel really lends itself to drawing graphs. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select my data, including in this case, the headings. And I'm going to go up to insert. And I'm looking for where it says up here, we have some graphs. And we've got a graph here, which is insert column or bar chart. So I'm going to select that. And we're looking for different types of graph. So I'm going to go for a 2D column graph. Now there are other things I could have done. I could have done a three day, but this is pretty good. But I want to improve this a little bit. So I'm going first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to change the heading. So I want to say 
popularity of pet. What else can I do? That gap is a little bit big. I think I'm going to play with my data format, this form of my data series. Um, you can see it comes up there, gap width. I can make the gap width bigger. You see what happens there? Or I can make it smaller. And I quite like that, that width. What else can I do? Well, basically you need to have a play with this. There's lots of different things you can do. If I select my data points, I think if I go to color, I could change the colors of them. Or, this is quite nice, I'm going to vary my color by point. So there, that's quite a nice little graph there. We can say, I could stick it perhaps, I could do a, a heading. Um, I, could, I could label the axes, for example, for the, the horizontal and the vertical. But nevertheless, that is a very quick way of doing a, um, a bar graph. So what about the, the next one? Well, that's going to be a pie chart. So let's move along here. And pie charts, again, are really quick to do. So select my data, go up to insert, and I'm going to, again, go to here. I'm going to the one that says pie chart. And there's lots of different functions you have. I'm going to have a standard pie chart. And here, I want to do a couple of things. First thing I'll do is let's change the heading. So popularity of pet. There's my first thing. And then I'm not so sure about this legend. I want to move this legend. Now, uh, I'm trying to remind myself where this is. I think yes, here. So legend options, I'm going to move it to the right. So that looks a little bit better for me. I like that more. This data is good, but I wonder if we could perhaps put some, some, um, some points on there. So I'm going to see if I can, uh, um, if I can change that a little bit. And maybe I'll do my add some data labels. So let's add some data points. Um, you can see there the numbers are appearing. And uh, I'm actually going to see if I can get them to go outside. So let's go for alignment. And I think, what can we do here? Let's have a look. And... I may possibly have done this wrong. Let me just try that again. And go to our data points. So format data labels. And there we go, outside end. So I want them actually to go outside. Interestingly, I only have it there for the six. So I've done I've done something wrong, wrong there with the data. I'm not quite sure what it was there. Try once again. Format the data series. There we go. And I want the values. And okay, well, something's gone wrong there. It should be able to do all of them. I think probably because I did um, just this one has gone something a bit wrong. But the concept is there, and you should be able to have the values all the way around. Um, I'm not going to worry about it just now, but there we have a lovely pie chart. There we have a bar chart. And basically, you experiment, you can do things, you can cut away pieces, you can change the colors, whatever you want to do. Another common graph we have is a scatter graph. So imagine here, I have um, some data on the pages of a book and how thick the book is. I want to draw a, um, a scatter graph. So I'm going to select this and this time insert. And I'm going to go to where it is there for, um, that's probably the wrong one actually. I'm going to go there for scatter graph. And I'm going to draw an ordinary scatter graph just like this. And so you can see there's move a bit to the right. We have uh, along one side, the pages. Along here, we have the thickness. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to say, could you draw me, please, a line of best fit? So let's add a trend line. And there it's done quite a nice. And you can see there's options there on the right-hand side. But there, very quickly, is a lovely scatter graph. Now I can improve it. I can change the scale, I can do other things, but actually that's quite good. And so I'd suggest you have a go at those. I'm going to do um, just a couple more things. We've got two more things to practice, and these are more complicated. So sometimes we are asked to work out to work with a frequency table. So here um, we have a bunch of people, different ages. We have some frequencies. 
So we don't know what the information is for. Let's say, for example, it's the number of children who go to a camp, let's say. There's one eight-year-old, there's two 10-year-olds, seven 13-year-olds, etc. And we want to work out the mean. So what you don't do is find the mean of 8, 10, 13, 14, 15, and 17, and then divide by 6, because there's only one 8-year-old, but there are 14, 15-year-olds. So what you want to do, really, is work out the mean of 8 plus 10 plus 10 plus 13 plus 13 and 13 and 13, 13, 13, 13, and 14 and 14 and 12 of those, and 14, 15s, and 4, 17s, and all of that. So what I want to do is I multiply. I multiply the age by the frequency. So I go equals, go over here to age, I multiply, which in this case is a star. We use, uh, we're all using an X, we use the, the asterisk, and I go into the one. You can see that's B5 times C5, and it tells me that that is eight. Next one, go over to 10, equals, and then multiply, and then I'm going to go to the 2, and there is 20. 2 times 10 is 20. Now, I can do all of that, but actually there's a shortcut. Now, if I select um, 10 and 12, you might notice that my cursor, when you do this, becomes a plus, and I can actually drag that formula down all of the way. So here, I can say that, for example, um, 417 is 68, and if you were to look at this up here, you can see that's B10 times C10. And there are lots of really useful shortcuts that you can do. So now I have enough to work out my information. How many children are there? Well, there's one and two and seven and 12 and 14 and four. So I want to add up that. I'm going to do equals sum brackets, and I'm going to select my frequencies. That'll tell me that there are 40 children. And now I'm going to do the sum of my right-hand column, equals sum, brackets, and I'm going to select all of these, close brackets, and 565. So my total of all of their ages, all 40 children, is 565. So to find the mean, I'm going to do 565 divided by 40. So equals, go up and select 565, Divide by, go up and select the 40, and so my mean is 14.1. And I would expect it to be around about 14.1, certainly somewhere between the 8 and the 17, somewhere about in the middle, but perhaps a little bit further down. So that's how I use a mean and median from a frequency table. And then the last one, you can do the same thing with cumulative frequency. So here, I have these 40 students. So first thing I can do is I can enter number of students, children, is sum, brackets, choose those. And now I can do some interesting work with cumulative frequency. I'm adding up as I go along. So first of all, I have one. That's the beginning one. But then I have two more. So I'm adding two plus the one. So look what I do. Equals, go left plus, and go up, one. And my cumulative frequency is three. Next one, equals, go left, add, go up one, add the three, and we have 10. So you'll look, if you look at this formula, you can see there, it's C6 plus D5. It's C7 plus D6. I did one more, equals, go left, grab the 12, plus, go up and grab the 10, up to 22 and I'm adding up each one as I come along. Now you probably can work out there I can just drag click and drag on the formulae and that will do it all the way for me. So here is D10 C10 which is over here plus D9 which is up there. So quick way of doing my cumulative frequency. If I wanted to find the position of the median, well I know that there are 40 um, children so my median, um, since it's discrete data, would be position 20.5. You might sometimes want to render it as 20, but strictly speaking, it's 20.5 because it is discrete. 
So up here, this tells me that the children from two to three are in age 10. The children from four to 10 are age 13. And the children from um, 11 to 22, because 22 is my cumulative frequency, from 11, so above the up to 10, 11 to 22 must be age 14. And I want to find position 20.5. Well, 20.5 is within that range 11 to 22. So 14 must be my median. So I can just type in there that the position will be that. Well, I can I can do that. I can say that is going to be um, open brackets 40 plus one, close brackets, divide by two. You'll see it tells me 20.5, and therefore my median age must be um, must be 14, because it's in there. And that doesn't quite make sense. We will look at that in mathematics. Well, we're almost done, but I was asked to draw a cumulative frequency graph. And we're going to go back and use our scatter graph for the last thing. And here, I'm not interested in this column, I'm interested in this one and this one. So I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to drag this. And now if I hold down the control key on my keyboard and drag the second bit, you can see I've selected those two columns. Now I go back to insert and I find scatter graphs. This time, I want to have the scatter graph where I'm actually going to connect them. Do I want straight lines? Do I want, let's try one perhaps with, um, with rounded lines. And you can see there that I have, it has created for me a lovely cumulative frequency graph. Now there are a couple of problems. I notice that it starts at eight, which I would expect, but half of the space isn't being used. So I'm going to select on data here. I'm going to, um, ask it to format the axis, and I'm going to say, rather than starting at zero, why don't we start at six? And if I do that, you will see immediately the cumulative frequency graph changes. It starts now at six, and that's easier to see. And then you could do some interesting stuff. If you drew your, um, your line at 20, you could find where the median is. And if you were to, um, for example, to um, or 20.5 actually, if you were to um, look at some of the other things, then you'd be able to work out where is the lower quartile and the upper quartile, etc. So to finish off then, what I want to say to you is that um, there's a lot of practice to go on here. And you might think, well, how do I know if I'm right or not? So rather than having to go through my video again, on the last tab, we have all of the answers. So you can see there, um, we have there all of my uh, calculations I've done. You can see my, um, um, my, my graphs. I've done correctly the favorite type of pet with the data points on the outside. And all of that is there that you can use to check your calculations as you are going along. So I hope that this has been useful. Um, as always, any feedback is, is appreciated. But the key thing to do now is to practice. So don't just, you know, watch it, have a go, try it a couple of times so that we indent it clearly into our minds. So thank you very much for taking this time.